to go. Um, hello, all of the brave people who are watching this <laughs> right now, and ultimately my wonderful students. Um, today we're going to talk about volcanoes, climate change, and then link that all to geoengineering. Um, I have a very special <laughs> guest today with us um, who is hopefully going to um, make me less boring, um, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Allie Rubin. Um, Allie is a geologist. She got her PhD from UC Davis in what year? 2016. 2016, great. Then she moved to Chicago, who actually met in California um, at an event at the annual conference that we all go to, um, the American Geophysical Union, AGU is the conference, and we met at an event called Gay GU because we're both straight. Um, mm -hmm. so it was held in the front room of a banana republic. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get through this. Okay. <laughs> so, so we're talking about uh, volcanoes, climate change, and geoengineering. So let's start with what is geoengineering? What does that mean? So um, that all starts with an understanding of Earth's radiation budget. So Earth's radiation budget um, is a measure of the amount of radiation that's coming in minus the amount of radiation that's going out. And we want that to be zero. And if it's zero, meaning in minus out is zero, then we have a stable climate. If it's not zero, one way or the other, then we either have climate warming or we have climate cooling. So um, here's a little schematic. Let me move our beautiful faces. Um, to the middle, perfect. <laughs> um, so on the left, we have the incoming radiation. This is radiation that's coming in from the sun. Um, shortwave radiation. A lot of it's reflected by clouds. The rest of it that's not reflected by clouds in the surface is absorbed at the surface. About 30% of all the radiation coming from the sun is reflected. So 70% makes it down to the surface, 30% is reflected. On the other side of the equation, um, we have the radiation that's going out of the Earth system. That's the radiation that's being emitted from the surface of the planet. Um, and then as it goes up into the atmosphere, it's intercepted by greenhouse gases, um, <clears throat> which absorb some of that energy, re-radiate it. That's the greenhouse effect. That's what keeps us, keeps us warm, relatively habitable. We've talked a lot about this in class. Um, and the rest of it that doesn't come back down to the surface is emitted to the atmosphere. Ultimately, you want this value to equal this value, and then you have a stable climate. Unfortunately, it does not equal that because we have global warming, so there's actually less radiation that's escaping out to space because the greenhouse effect is larger, and so we have an imbalance. Um, the radiation budget is out of balance, there's less radiation going out of the atmosphere than is coming in, and that equals global warming. Also, for people who are watching this uh, live or whatever, um, I feel like a boomer for sure saying that. Uh, <laughs> um, but like, please like ask questions if you want, and we will answer them because I can actually see the the thing on my phone, um, and so we can answer your questions. Maybe, probably not, but maybe. Um, so the idea here is that there's more radiation that's being trapped at the it, within the Earth system. So our goal is to either limit the greenhouse effect by reducing um, our emissions of carbon dioxide, or conversely, um, do something called geoengineering. Geoengineering is basically the manipulation of a part of the Earth system, the atmosphere, um, the surface, whatever. Um, to counterbalance the global warming caused by excess greenhouse effects. So the idea here that we're going to talk about today is that if we can alter the amount of sunlight that's being reflected, like if we can increase how much sunlight is being reflected, um, then we can potentially counterbalance the imbalance in radiation that's been produced by a stronger greenhouse effect. And from what I've read 
um, in various places, we want to uh, ref increase the reflectivity of the Earth by about uh, 2%, 2% more. Um, and the main proposal to do that is to put particulates, which we call aerosols, into the stratosphere. And this was all um, laid out in an essay book. Um, really exciting reading. Highly recommend this reading material, A Case for Climate Engineering by David Keith, um, where he walks through the proposal and some of the pros and cons, the ethics, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that, are, that are kind of like involved oh, yeah. in, um, oh my gosh, in um, in doing this, so I have some some a lot of thoughts on geoengineering, um, but uh, I'll try not to be too biased when we talk about this. But I think my bias will probably come through. Ali, have you like heard of geoengineering? Have you have is this book on your on your quarantine reading list or? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I actually really don't know that much about geoengineering at all. So this has been really educational for me as well. Cool. Um, so Allie's about to talk learn. to people on different ends of the geological spectrum. Right. Yeah, that's right. Allie is a geologist, so um, that means she studies rocks, right? Yeah. Whereas I um, love rocks but don't know anything about them. All right, so the main proposal here is to put aerosols, particulates, into the stratosphere. Where the hell is the stratosphere? The stratosphere is a layer of the atmosphere above the Earth. Um, you can actually see it kind of in this picture here, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, which in this schematic you can see is called the troposphere. That's where all the weather happens. That's where the clouds are. That's where airplanes fly generally, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right above that is the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is called the stratosphere because it's stratified, um, which means that it's warmer um, at the top than it is at the bottom. So air doesn't really move through the stratosphere. Um, it's very, it's kind of a stagnant stratified layer of the atmosphere, which is what makes it ideal, quote unquote ideal, place to put aerosols um, if we were gonna do this geoengineering thing. Um, and uh, you're probably like, why, um, what does this have to do with volcanoes? We're, we're getting there, I promise. Um, Right, so why in the stratosphere? Um, also, I am obsessed with this. Uh, oh my god. I'm is that a dragon? With... <laughs> Apparently, Allie, this is a depiction of the eruption of Mount Tambora. I have been brought here to be mocked. <laughs> okay, yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> so, why are we putting things in the stratosphere? Uh, as I mentioned, it's very stratified, which means that there's very little moisture in the stratosphere because clouds and rain can't really get up there above the lowest layer. So instead, if particles are able to get into the stratosphere, um, they remain there for a really long time. They're not rained out. Um, they don't get absorbed into clouds. And so it can take months or years in many cases for those particles, once they get to the stratosphere, to get out of the stratosphere. Um, and so, unrelated, but some something that, that, that has been happening in the stratosphere that's kind of bad and related to this, where particles can't really be removed, is the ozone hole. So we put a lot of freon particles in the stratosphere, um, and they're there for, for, for years, decades, really, um, without being removed, and they destroy ozone, which is a problem that I'm, I'm not going to talk about right now, but I love going on um, tangents. So... <laughs> so um, that brings us to volcanoes, um, and that's the whole reason why I have Allie here, because she studies volcanoes. Actually, Allie, do you want to talk about, like, just briefly, like, the research that you did when you were in grad school on volcanoes? Sure. Well, I will also say I studied volcanoes. I haven't really studied them since 2016, so bear with me. My knowledge is not uh, on the cutting edge anymore. Um, but when I was in undergrad and grad school, um, I studied volcanoes, um, basically focusing on what we call large silicic volcanic centers. So volcanoes like um, more like Yellowstone and specifically the Taupo Volcanic Zone in New Zealand, um, more so that than places like Hawaii, which are very different volcanic systems. 
Um, so basically what I studied was what's happening in volcanoes. Um, what are the processes that go on in them before, during, yeah, before and during eruptions? Um, and what time scales do they occur on? Because we can't go inside volcanoes, we have to use a lot of different proxies to get a sense of what's actually happening inside them, um, which is where geochemistry comes in and which is what I think is the most fascinating and interesting <laughs> science on earth. That's, I mean, okay, you're wrong, but that's, I, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate but you study clouds, I guess. That's fine. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Wait, do you have a, don't you have like a cool rock or something? I have so many cool rocks. I, I'll grab my favorite. Okay. Grab your favorite. I'll go through this slide while you're doing that. Um, so the reason we're interested in volcanoes, um, is because volcanic eruptions produce, produce two things. They produce gases. Uh, in addition to lava and stuff, I'm talking about things that go in the atmosphere. They produce gases, and then they produce aerosols, which are particles suspended in air. And you see where I'm going with this. Those aerosols are probably going to make their way to the stratosphere. Okay, show me your rocks. This is a rock. Um, uh, it's hard to see for scale here. I'll just show you, I guess, my finger. Um, but this Wait, is let me blow a... you up. Let me see if I can blow you. Can I blow you up? No. I can. Go ahead. This is a big piece of lava. It's from New Zealand. It's from, uh, I believe, Rapehu. Um, and the reason why this rock is super cool is that it has these kind of grayish chunks in here within the matrix of the black lava. Um, these grayish chunks are called xenoliths. Xeno from the Greek meaning foreign, lith meaning rock, so foreign rock. And they basically represent, this rock represents lava that was moving up through the Earth's surface and it picked up chunks of the Earth's crust on its way to the surface. And you can tell that this basically was coming up to the Earth's surface super, super fast because the contacts between these chunks and the lava around it are really sharp. The rock hasn't had time to start melting yet. So the lava picked up this rock and then basically, next thing you know, it's erupting on the Earth's surface. And so, then, but then, it, as it cooled, that rock didn't melt ever. Mm -mm. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, cool. Very cool. I picked this rock up in New Zealand and lugged it around with me for about a month before I went home. Cool. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, what are aerosols, and how do they affect? Uh, uh, climate. Um, hang on. Someone also just said, Quentin, is this is this actually like live? Yeah. So that's weird. I don't know why it's not showing my my screen. But that's fun. <laughs> Hang on. Um, oh, I think maybe because. Hmm. Um, oh. That's weird. Um, okay, hold on, Allie. I'm gonna try this. Try to fix this. Yeah. I don't know why it's broke. Okay, hold on. It's just me Not and you there. now. It's just me and you now. Um, <clears throat> I don't know why it didn't work. It broke. So you were alive. Yeah, I was, and then I had it like wasn't showing anything. I guess. Hmm. So that's fun. Oh, I'm still recording the like, um, oh, cool, the quick time. So just <laughs> I won't say anything bad. Um, 
I don't remember how I did this. TBH. Okay, I think it's working again. Whoa. <clears throat> cool. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, that's weird. Sorry. We may have to go back and do some of that. That's fine. I'm, um, I'm very, I'm funny. Hopefully it's working now um, for people. So um, okay, cool. Quentin, is it working? <laughs> Quentin, can you check to see if it's like working? I think it might be working this time, hopefully. Um, I'm just going to wait a second to see. Yeah, I think it's working now. OK, so all right, cool. So now it's like actually working. <laughs> so, Tight. so I'm just going <laughs> to. Hopefully people uh, saw the first part of this. Sorry um, for those who are watching and were very confused. Um, we're just going to go back through this really quickly. <laughs> um, we're talking about volcanoes, climate change, geoengineering, um, how there's a radiation imbalance uh, in minus out. Um, we have Allie here to, <laughs> to make jokes, I guess, and talk about uh, geology because she is a very... Um, a very excellent geologist and she studied volcanoes and also a great friend of mine. And the idea here is that we're talking about geoengineering. Um, okay, yes, it's working now. Sorry, everybody, uh, we're back. So the idea here is that with geoengineering, we can alter the amount of sunlight that is being reflected. And if we can increase the amount of sunlight that's being reflected, we can counterbalance the radiation imbalance that's being produced by the greenhouse effect of increased uh, increased carbon dioxide emissions. All right. The main proposal to do this um, is to inject particulates into the stratosphere. Is it working now? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, now I definitely feel like a boomer. <laughs> I'm like I know how to use Facebook Live. I'm so cool and and hip and whatever. Uh, <clears throat> we need more millennial energy coming in to counterbalance the boomer energy that's going out right now. <laughs> so anyway, the main proposal here is um, to inject aerosols into the stratosphere. Um, and so the stratosphere, as I mentioned, is the layer of atmosphere that's directly above uh, the surface layer where most of the weather happens. So you can see from this image from space, this is the surface layer where all of the clouds and, and the whole everything that happens in the atmosphere that you think of it as the atmosphere happens. And then above that is the stratified stratosphere. Um, and the reason the stratosphere is, is, a, is an ideal layer in which to inject these aerosols is because there is very little moisture in the stratosphere. So if aerosols, particulates do get up there, <clears throat> they're not removed by clouds and by rain and instead they stay there for a long time until they eventually settle out due to gravity. And uh, Ali wanted me to include this painting because it's amazing, honestly. Actually, I truly like don't understand it, Ali. How accurate is this painting? Is this depicting? I mean, it's accurate that there are dragons. It's not <laughs> accurate that the dragons are, are dripping all that out of their mouths. That's really what's tripping me up. So I have a lot of questions for the artist of this piece. Okay, well... Hopefully they're listening. <laughs> um, all right. 
So volcanoes and climate, volcano, volcanic eruptions produce gas, and they produce aerosols, which are particles suspended in air. So briefly, what are aerosols? This is where we were. Um, hopefully you can go back and, and actually maybe Ali, you should just show us the rock that you were talking about because people didn't get to see the rock. I'll show the rock again. This show is the rock, the rock I had showed before. Also, I'll introduce myself, not in an insane way. Yeah, introduce um, I'm yourself. also just here to roast Minka. Um, I'm Allie. Uh, I got my PhD in 2016 from UC Davis, and I have not studied since then, so I'm not on the cutting edge of research, but I can tell you what I know from about nine or ten years of studying volcanoes. Um, and this is my favorite rock that I have because it is a big hunk of lava from New Zealand, um, and inside it, you can see these gray uh, angular shapes. They look kind of like triangles and parallelograms and stuff. Um, and those represent pieces of the Earth's crust that were essentially torn loose uh, by this lava on their way up to the surface as this lava was being erupted. Um, so you can tell this whole process happened very quickly because these shapes are so angular. Um, they did not have time to start melting in the hot lava. Um, so they're called xenoliths, and that's from the Greek xeno, meaning foreign, and lith, meaning rock. Xenolith, foreign, rock. Um, anyway, this is my favorite rock because it's very cool, and also it's very indicative of the kinds of tools that we use in geochemistry to see what's happening inside volcanic centers when we can't actually physically look inside them. Great. And that's the whole rock spiel times two. <laughs> Thank you for the, the new and improved spiel on rocks also um my the only way i know that i was like not recording anything is because one of my former students sent me a text so thank you ev for <laughs> for doing that so discreetly as to um allow me to save myself then to just show the same could you imagine if i just showed the same first slide for this whole lecture and was like Ooh. yeah, yeah I, could. I can't imagine that <laughs> what's your all point? right <laughs> so, the, so the idea here is that we are trying to geoengineer the climate. We're trying to put, I'm just going to go back to that slide one more time. We're trying to put um, aerosols into the stratosphere to balance out the excess energy that has been absorbed by the Earth system due to climate change. So we're trying to increase the amount of sunlight that we can reflect. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to put or the idea is behind geoengineering is that we're going to put reflective aerosols into the stratosphere. The stratosphere is high up there. It's, <clears throat> it's stratified, which means it's warmer at the top than it is at the bottom of the layer, which means that anything that gets in there stays in there for a really long time. So we want to be efficient if we're going to do this, right? Um, if, we're going to, if we're actually going to geoengineer, we want to be efficient. So we're going to put these reflective particulates up into the stratosphere. The reason that volcanoes are important is because volcanoes do that. Volcanoes do put reflective aerosols into the stratosphere. So we can actually use volcanic eruptions and the consequences of these volcanic eruptions in Earth's history to talk about what might happen if we geoengineer. If we put particulates into the stratosphere, it will be similar to what happens during a volcanic eruption. Um, so we have, we have all these observations of volcanic eruptions of what might happen to use as an analogy for what might happen if we do decide to geoengineer. So just briefly, what are aerosols or particulates and how do they affect climate just as a, as a, in a broad sense? There are four main types of aerosols that we divide them, divide them into. Um, so Ali is a, um, is a, is a geologist who studies volcanoes. I am a climate scientist who studies aerosols actually. So this is a beautiful, um, talk to be getting together honestly which is why i really wanted to do it um <clears throat> so there are four main types of types of aerosols there are um, aerosols that come from wildfires that are smoky and dark in color there are aerosols that come off the ocean sea salt aerosols these are really bright and big aerosols they typically fall down really quickly but if you've ever been to the ocean or the beach um, in the summer and it's sunny out you can kind of see the haze that's hanging in the air that those are the sea salt aerosols um there are also aerosols that are mobilized from deserts, desert sand, little particulates of sand, which we call dust in the climate community. They're different than the little dust that's under your bed from not vacuuming um, often enough. And then there are 
I grouped them together, although Allie might yell at me for doing this, there are industrial slash volcanic aerosols, which are dominated by sulfate or sulfur um, dioxide, I believe. Uh, Allie's going to talk about that because she knows more about that than I do. But um, these aerosols are typically very, very bright. Um, the aerosols that are in the lowest layer of the atmosphere that come from industrial sources typically combine with water vapor to produce smog. Um, which you can kind of see in, a, in this picture. And then if they get up into the stratosphere, then they're sort of volcanic aerosols in the stratosphere, which will simulate what would happen if we were to do this whole geoengineering thing. So we're going to focus on these sulfate aerosols. Um, what do they do? How do they work? So there are three main ways that aerosols interact with the climate. There's the direct, the indirect, and a semi-direct. The direct effect, which is what we're concerned with when we talk about volcanoes, is bright aerosols which reflect sunlight okay so you have clean air and the sunlight coming through polluted air the sunlight's coming through it hits the pollution the the aerosols and it some of it bounces back to space kind of like a cloud so this has a cooling effect on the surface because it lets less sunlight through that layer of the atmosphere cooling down the surface the indirect effect has to do with a similar process but with clouds so if there's a cloud and it's reflecting sunlight, like clouds are do, um, <laughs> um, then you put aerosols into it. You put pollution into that cloud. What it does is it makes the droplets of the cloud smaller. Those smaller droplets are more reflective of sunlight, so they actually increase the brightness of the cloud and reflect more sunlight back to space and do reduce the temperature at the surface. This effect is not something that typically happens from volcanoes because volcanoes inject their aerosols all the way up into the stratosphere where there are no clouds. The last effect is the semi-direct effect, which has nothing to do with volcanoes as well, um, but does have to do with wildfire aerosols. So for those of you who live in places that are prone to wildfires like California or the West, um, these aerosols from wildfires are a little bit darker than volcanic aerosols. They have a high black carbon content they absorb a lot of sunlight and therefore they actually warm the atmosphere around them and increase the stability of the atmosphere, meaning it's less likely that clouds will form in this type of atmosphere and so actually the surface in this scenario gets warmer. So when we talk about volcanoes, we're specifically talking about the direct effect, volcanoes and geoengineering, the direct effect of aerosols essentially acting as a very, very high level cloud. So, yeah, to kind of tie that up, to tie that together, injections of gas and aerosols into the atmosphere from volcanoes have very strong effects on climate, and they can cause, uh, generally cause this, this short-term cooling from direct effects, and then a very, very minor long-term cooling, which we're not going not to talk about in this, in this lecture. And also, uh, just to jump on that, when, we, when I say uh, short-term versus long-term, that's geological. So short-term meaning like months to years yeah. and long-term meaning, you know, anything above that. Like millions of years. Millions right? of years. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Exactly. And that's not something we're going to talk about here because we don't, we don't have millions of years. <laughs> so volcanoes, um, as I've been mentioning all along here, volcanoes are a good analogy, a good proxy for determining what might happen if we do end up trying global geoengineering. Um, because volcanoes, right, see, here's a picture. I think this is Mount St. Helens. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, this is Mount St. Helens erupting, and you can see all these really bright sulfur aerosols getting up into the, um, into the stratosphere, and there they, um, they, they reflect a lot of sunlight. They cool the surface much in the same way that geoengineering would do. So we have a lot of examples of volcanoes altering the climate, um, as kind of um, an inspiration for why this is an approach that people are seriously considering. Um, so it's important to note that volcanoes have this effect, whereas wildfires and smokestacks, etc., do not, because their aerosols do not get into the stratosphere. The stratosphere is the key component to this, to this conversation. So... Um, I don't know, Allie, do you want to go from here or do you want to wait until we get to Tambora? Sure. Okay, so I'm going to hand this uh, off to Allie for a minute. Yeah, so Mika's done a great job of talking about aerosols. Um, 
In terms of the short-term cooling, like she was talking about, which is the direct effect, um, the aerosol, and there are a bunch of different kinds of aerosols in volcanoes uh, or in the stuff that is erupted. Uh, sulfur is not the only one. We're also erupting gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, hydrofluoric acid, things like that. Uh, but sulfur and the compounds that it forms have the strongest effects on climate. Next. <laughs> I feel like I'm in 1955. Um, and that's because, because there is a lot of water um, in a lot of the magmas that do erupt explosively uh, and therefore inject aerosols into the stratosphere, um, this erupted sulfur is able to combine with water to form tiny, tiny drops of sulfuric acid. And it's shown in the chemical equation, H2O or water plus SO2, which is sulfur dioxide, yields H2SO4 uh, or sulfuric acid. And what's important about this is that as was kind of shown in the little um, cartoon a couple slides ago, these tiny, tiny droplets, you have millions and billions of them, they end up forming these kind of hazes or cloud-like smog-like bodies that end up reflecting sunlight back into space, removing that sunlight from coming into earth and causing cooling. Um, so eventually, these sulfuric acid droplets, all these little things, eventually, if you inject a bunch of them into the stratosphere, um, like Mika said, there's not a lot of mixing happening. The stratosphere is super stratified. Uh, eventually, these sulfuric acid droplets will start bumping into each other, and they'll start coalescing. And as they do so, they will coalesce together, and they'll become bigger. When they become bigger, they become heavier. But because there's not a lot of movement happening, this coalescing takes a really long amount of time. So when you inject a lot of sulfur, um, the sulfurous haze into the stratosphere, it can hang out there for up to months or years. The magnitude of this effect depends on a lot of things. Uh, for example, the location of the eruption. Uh, and Mika can talk more about this because she loves the earth and the <laughs> sky and all that fun stuff. Uh, but for example, she loves you the earth. <laughs> If you have a volcano erupting near the equator, it's going to be much easier and quicker to circulate those particles around the Earth. Um, whereas if you have a volcanic eruption that's much closer to one of the poles, um, once it gets in the stratosphere, it's not going to be able to transport itself uh, on as big of a global scale. And then additionally, your volcanic eruption needs to be a couple things. It needs to be large enough and have enough sulfur in it to have this kind of global effect. So for example, it needs to have enough volume and enough sulfur in the volume of magma that it actually has an effect once it gets in there. Um, all sorts of volcanoes have different chemistries. Some volcanic eruptions contain lots of sulfur. Some volcanic eruptions contain not a lot of sulfur. So it's kind of luck of the draw there. Um, and then additionally, in terms of magnitude, some volcanic eruptions are very, very big. Um, so they may not have a lot of proportional sulfur, but if you erupt a thousand cubic kilometers of material with not a lot of sulfur, you're still going to get a lot of sulfur up into the stratosphere in contrast to uh, maybe a very small eruption that contains a high proportion of sulfur. Oh yeah, I put this in here because I thought it looked really cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this kind of shows all of the different ways that, uh, that a volcano can impact the, the Earth system from, from hours after the eruption to years after the eruption. So hours after the eruption, you have things like pyroclastic flow, which I actually don't know what that means. Allie, do you want to explain that? Yeah, so I think a helpful way to think about volcanic, we call things that you can that can hurt you from a volcano, volcanic hazards. Um, and volcanic hazards can be direct or indirect. So things that are direct are things like ash fall. So a volcano produces ash, it falls down, um, a bunch of ash accumulates on your roof and your roof collapses. That's actually indirect. Damn it, that's a terrible idea. Um, a pyroclastic flow is a really good example of a direct hazard because a pyroclastic flow is a superheated mass of gas, ash, and rock that basically is uh, ejected from a volcano. It tumbles down the side of the volcano. It comes to you, it engulfs you, and you are killed, much like the people died uh, at Pompeii in 79 AD. Got it, okay. Yeah. 
So um, basically, as you go further in time, the more indirect these hazards become. I see. Uh, things like tsunamis can either be direct or indirect, depending on how they're generated. And then ash fall, changes in the global supply chain, and then climate effects are very much indirect, indirect. hazards. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I never knew what a pyroclastic flow was, actually, um, even though I teach, have taught this lecture at least five times before this. <laughs> okay, so here um, I put, I found this really ominous picture of uh, Ana Krakatoa erupting earlier this year, I believe, or maybe this is Hawaii, actually. Um, it's a remember. pretty big eruption. I, that looks kind of like Krakatoa. Yeah, I think it's Ana Krakatoa. That's, that's the baby Krakatoa, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I want to look at some case studies, um, which is like why I brought Allie here, because she knows a lot about the first major volcanic eruption that we're going to talk about, which is the eruption of Mount Tambora. Um, there is also the eruption of Mount Laki in Iceland and the eruption of Mount Krakatoa in, in Indonesia, which we're not going to talk about today. And then we'll finish with the more recent major volcanic eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. All right, so the eruption of Mount Tambora. Um, I'm going to let Allie talk to you about this, and I will interject at opportune times to try and derail her. Um, also, <laughs> there are a bunch of people watching, um, which is really cool and fun. So don't be shy to ask questions in the on like on the Facebook thing, and uh, I will try and like read them out loud, and we'll answer them together. So just yeah, feel free to like type along and ask anything you want. All right. Yeah, so I've had, I've had three sips of wine and I can't see the questions, so just. I've had a, a, I've had almost a full glass of tequila with lemon juice. So gorgeous. That's where we are. Um, I love this painting of the eruption of Mount Tambora. Apparently, um, <laughs> it's very idyllic looking, and I love the sailboat. But go ahead, Allie. Truly, so this is a great picture of the places you'd want to be when it was erupting. <laughs> Um, so Mika has talked about how these are good case studies. I should specify they're good case studies for um, how we as geologists understand the uh, interactions volcanoes have with climate and the effect that volcanoes have on climate. Um, Tambora is probably, in my opinion, the eruption we have the most information on in terms of how volcanoes can have devastating effects on the climate and in turn the effects that those can have on civilization. Um, so this quote here, let me move my little Skype face. Uh, God, I'm old. Uh, let me move my little Skype, my little Skype no, notification. Skype face. <laughs> okay, boomer. Uh, Even a small quantity of ash could devastate plants and wildlife. One district that received about one and one quarter inch of ash discovered that its crops were completely beaten down and covered by it. Dead fish floated on the surfaces of ponds, and scores of small birds lay dead on the ground. So this is the description of someone who was there at Tambora, and it is a description of, as we discussed before, pretty much direct hazards. Like ash came out of a volcano, it fell down on the ground, and it beat down a bunch of plants that were close to the volcano, and it killed a bunch of the fish and the birds that were nearby. So the direct effects were pretty bad. I believe um, it killed about uh, 10,000 people by pyroclastic flows, which we were just talking about. Um, and all of this happened with an erupted, um, an erupted volume of about 100 cubic kilometers of material. And so for context, if you think about um, Mount St. Helens, the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, and even Pinatubo, all of them erupted less than about 10 cubic kilometers of material. So this is about 10 times bigger than those eruptions. Of the stuff that was erupted in that was about 55 million tons of sulfur dioxide, uh, which ended up combining in the atmosphere to form, as we talked about before, it mixed, or sorry, reacted with the water vapor and formed 100 million tons of sulfuric acid. So it was a very sulfur-rich magma um, and created a really large cloud of sulfuric acid, uh, which, due to its location on the Earth, which you can talk about if you want, um, it ended up circling the Earth pretty thoroughly within about two weeks and caused cooling of the Earth's surface by about half a degree to one degree Celsius, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we'll talk about some of the effects that that had, mm -hmm. which are very dramatic. Um, and then addition, uh, in addition, because of these changes in heating and cooling that happened in the stratosphere, they also affected precipitation patterns all over the world. So for example, I think 
The biggest example of a change in that pattern is it ended up breaking the monsoon cycle in Asia. Um, it ended up changing the temperature of the Bay of Bengal in India. Uh, and because of that temperature change, it altered the water chemistry and allowed a new strain of cholera to take over, to which the people of India were not immune. So it caused a cholera uh, outbreak and epidemic uh, that people were not prepared for and were not resistant to. I saw a like cartoon or something before while I was making this, and it said that since 1800, 60% of all the material that's erupted from volcanoes came from the eruption of Tambora. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Does that sound right? Uh, it could, yeah. Yeah, that's it, it so big, much. It was a pretty big eruption. That's yeah. a huge eruption. Yeah. Yeah. Also, and the upper ends is kind of like uh, super volcanoes, as we call them, can erupt like thousand, a thousand or so cubic kilometers. So a hundred is like not the most that's ever been erupted, but it's still you know pretty damn substantial. What's a, a super volcano that we should be really worried about erupting in the next like ten years is Yellowstone, right? No, no, don't even joke about that. No, <laughs> yeah, sorry, no. Fine. <laughs> um, Yellowstone is not going to erupt. <laughs> Um, oh, also, Ali mentioned that the location of Tambora was important. It, it being at the equator means that its aerosols can get into both hemispheres, which is why this, why it's such an so has such a large effect on the whole globe, um, because there's not a lot of mixing between the hemispheres. But if you are close to or on the equator, then there is a lot of mixing between the hemispheres um, because you can get it into both. So that's important uh, to note. Okay, so now Ali is going to talk about um, some of the climate effects of this eruption, specifically like uh, the, the following year, which um, was referred to as the year without a summer. And apparently some people in, in North America were referring to it as 1800 and froze to death. So, and I, this ominous, ominous photo, this ominous painting is also by JMW Turner. Okay, so go ahead, sorry. I love it, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly like Mika said, 1815, Tambora erupts. Um, the global cooling starts the following year. We have the year without a summer, um, which sounds very dramatic, but also it quite literally was the year without a summer. I mean, there are accounts of Fourth of July uh, parades in New England and America in which there's snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. and they're like, happy Fourth of July, there's snow on the ground. Um, That's crazy. I would lose crazy. my mind. Yeah. 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 Um, in addition, uh, the temperature change caused a huge famine. Uh, it destroyed tons of crops, uh, especially right off the top of my head in Britain and Ireland. Um, wherever there is famine, there are usually epidemics that follow. Uh, so in, I believe it was Ireland, there's a huge uh, typhus epidemic due to everyone's weakened state essentially from the famine. Um, and then, like I said before, the cholera outbreak that happened in India. So all of this global cooling basically brought everyone's crops way down. And then all of the different things that happened from there can directly be traced to the change in temperature caused by this eruption. Um, and in addition, Mika is showing a lot of pictures uh, painted by Turner. Um, yeah, you can go to that if you oh, want. Okay. Um, he is known. Do you have the slide with, with I what? guess we can get to it later. Um, I can go ahead to it. Which yeah, one this is another want? dramatic quote. The White Mountains were just covered in snow. Blah, blah, blah. This one? Uh, yeah, I was just, yeah, I was going to say, uh, because ash is injected into the atmosphere, uh, fine ash, really small particles of ash, which basically ash, volcanic ash, it's not ash like you would find in a fireplace. It's really, really, really tiny pieces of glass. Um, and these little tiny pieces of glass scatter light wavelengths. So because, sorry, they scatter shorter light wavelengths which are blue violet and they let through light with longer wavelengths which are red and orange uh so this produced really vivid sunsets which a lot of works of art that were made in the 1800s uh see and turner was one of the artists that painted lots of pictures of sunsets and of england i believe around the time and he is one of the people whose work really reflects the changes uh due to I forget if it was Tambora or a different volcanic eruption. No, J.M.W. Yeah. Turner is Tambora, and this and Edward then Munch. This is Krakatoa. Is, yeah, it's from Krakatoa. Yeah, yeah. the okay. the screen painting, which is like really iconic, and I think inspired actually the screen mask from the screen movie. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's actually Matthew Lillard in the middle. Thank yeah. you. 
Uh, someone commented <laughs> on someone commented that Chicago would lose half its population if there was no summer, and I would agree. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was called the year without brunch season. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, right. <laughs> the year without patios, patio season. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this is a quote. Uh, I had not seen this quote before. Uh, oh yeah, I pulled this quote. Apparently it snowed six inches in New England on June 6th. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So there was like snow in the mountains. Yeah, you can start seeing, uh, Turner's starting to paint these more vivid sunsets. Mm -hmm. Slide. Um, there's also some other, um, some other indirect effects that people have hypothesized where the links are much more tenuous um, but, you know, the data are there if you want to try and back it up. Uh, so, for example, there was a cold snap, like Mika just mentioned, in New England that caused many farmers to try their luck migrating west. Uh, this caused a population increase in the Midwest uh, where they stopped, probably short-sightedly. Um, and you can see that Indiana and Illinois became states in 1816 and 1818, uh, respectively, uh, due to the increases in population. Uh, there's also financial aspects so the boom and bust of grain that happened due to these changes in crop stability led to the panic of 1819 uh there's actually a bunch of different smaller panics and recessions and fluctuations that happens but i don't know enough about the economy to really care about that i'm sorry um <laughs> Uh, my personal <laughs> Tell me how you really is, feel, Ali, really. I don't know anything about money. It's all made up. Uh, <laughs> uh, my personal favorite line of thought I've seen hypothesized, but I don't fully believe in myself, but I think it's interesting enough to warrant a mention. Um, some people have hypothesized that because the cost of food increased dramatically due to all the crop failures and famines happening worldwide, the price of oats increased, making it more expensive to feed horses, which were at the time the main form of transportation. And this has been linked to, very tenuously, the invention of the bicycle in 1817 in Germany. Do I think this is a direct cause and effect from tambour erupting to the invention of the bicycle? Absolutely not. But I do think it's interesting. I mean, there's just because it's not the primary reason doesn't mean that it didn't facilitate it or push it along yeah, exactly. in a way that's like, uh, you know, allowed for the bicycle to be invented maybe earlier than it otherwise would have. Yeah. Yeah. Also, my uh, really, really, really good friend from growing up uh, just said that she loves the Turner paintings, which just thought I'd say that. That's great. Um, I've never seen one IRL, but... Um, you work at the Art Institute. Yeah, I know. Uh, but uh, I wonder if... I wonder if <laughs> Kieran uh, knew that the Turner paintings were actually, like, in the color of the atmosphere was inspired by uh, the eruption of the volcano. Because that's not something that even I knew until you told me this, Ellie, which is cool. Yeah, it's interesting. There's actually a whole field of... Um, like geologic art historians who will go back and try and link uh, the times of volcanic eruptions um, to specific paintings hmm. because cool. the times that paintings are made are generally pretty well constrained. And there are a bunch of volcanoes um, whose eruptive histories are not as well constrained. Hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I know I read an article that they're actually using the skies from some of these paintings, not just the Turners, but some others like you were mentioning, to actually deduce what the climate was during that time. Like Very cool. Yeah, super cool. All right. Go ahead. Um, my personal favorite is uh, in 1818, or I guess 1817 maybe, uh, Mary Shelley and uh, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron uh, ended up in Lake Geneva, Switzerland. Um, they first uh, spent our pleasant hours on the lake or wandering on its shores, but it proved a wet ungenial summer and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house to Mary Shelley quote um I believe it was Lord Byron who said hey the weather sucks we all have to stay inside which of us can tell the best ghost story uh and they all had to write their interpretation of a ghost story and Mary Shelley won because she wrote Frankenstein and it was published in 1818 is this actually the name of it? I was like Googling for like old timey Frankenstein book covers and it says mm -hmm. Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Yeah. That's cool. I'm into yeah. that. Um, <laughs> oops. 
Okay. Oh, and then this one, I you have like a cool story written about this in the um, like caption of this slide. Uh, let's see if I can remember it. Mm-hmm. Um, is this the one? Li Yang, I believe, was a Chinese poet who had to stop being a poet in yeah. order to support his family. Yeah. Um, because China was especially hard hit by the eruption. Um, it caused a, like I said before, there were. Uh, It broke the monsoon cycle, so the weather became really unpredictable and erratic. Um, And then also, because of that, it caused a lot of issues with crops and with rice. Um, So this is a quote from him, um, I believe a poem. I had another one too, but people rush from falling houses in their thousands. It's worse than the work of thieves. Bricks crack, walls fall. In an instant, the house is gone. My child catches my coat and cries out. I'm running in the muddy road, then back to rescue my money and grains from the ruins. What else to do? My loved ones must eat. So, again, a real downer. Um, (laughs) They were really, really hard hit by that. Um, Another economic effect leading off of this, I'm not sure if I mentioned this elsewhere in the slideshow, is that because rice... Uh, they had trouble growing rice as a crop and one crop that was introduced that was a lot more stable and easy to grow ended up being poppies for opium. Um, Mm. So it accelerated a lot of the opium Mm. trade that happened and rose in the mid to late 1800s. Yeah, that's super interesting. Also, someone wrote that um, Doctor Who had an episode about Mary Shelley and how Frankenstein was written. Really? I haven't seen that one. So you'll have to watch that because I don't watch Doctor Who, but I feel like you watch every show on TV, so... I mostly, I mean, okay. Wow, calm do you, down. Do you watch <laughs> Doctor Who or not, Allie? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. Um, we covered <laughs> this. We covered this. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Mount Pinatubo, and then um, Allie's going to interrupt me when I say things that are incorrect. Um, but, oh, actually, uh, did we already talk about where you did your field work? Oh, it was New Zealand, right? Uh-huh. But you've been to Tambora. No, I've been to Krakatau. Oh, you've been to Krakatau. Yeah. Which is its own island. Yes. So Krakatau was like a stratovolcano, which is what we call volcanoes with that classic conical shape. Mm -hmm. Um, It was like rising up out of the ocean. And then when it erupted, it blew itself apart. And since then, the volcanic center itself is still active. So over time, it's been building a new volcano which is called as you said before Anak Krakatau or Child of Krakatau um and that's what's starting to like reach above the water and get bigger and bigger and bigger oh it blew itself completely under the water yes oh I didn't know that I thought it just like blew a big hole but it was still an island no oh I like the blew- whole wow. edifice was was like blown apart um but oh. the the edifice was gone, but the center itself stayed in the same place. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. So, right. So, uh, Krakatoa or Krakatau, you keep saying Krakatau. Is it Krakatau or Krakatoa? Uh, the actual name is Krakatau. It was uh, anglicized to Krakatoa by some mm. white men. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll stop doing so, that. Then. Way to keep upholding um, <laughs> Krakatau. Uh, so, there have been several large, like the, vol- the volcanic eruption. Uh, magnitude that's necessary to modify the climate is it needs to be big like real fucking big and only a few meet that cr- criteria Tambora, uh, Krakatau, El Chichon uh, in the 80s which where is that that's in Mexico or mm-hmm. yeah and then Pinatubo. Pinatubo is the last uh, major eruption that had noticeable effect on the climate uh, and that happened in 1991. No, sorry go ahead. That's no, it's fine. I, I just wanted to say that you mean globally, right? Globally, globally, globally. Okay, yeah. yeah. Because there are some other, one volcanic eruption I like a lot that you cut out, I guess, for my slides. Wow. That's fine. Uh, was Laki, mm-hmm. which happened in the 1700s in Iceland. And it was a super small eruption and released so much uh, hydrofluoric gas into the atmosphere that it ended up causing a famine that killed 25% of Iceland's population. Sure. Okay. Um, so it had a huge effect on the climate, but just localized. Right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Keep going. Um, <laughs> so, right. To have a global effect, it needs to be big and it needs to be at the equator. Um, so the last big equatorial eruption was the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines uh, in 1991, June 15th, 1991, I believe. Um, 
And I love this. There are a lot of photographs uh, of the eruption, actually. Um, and this one is so cool and striking um, and kind of reminds me of Ali's favorite movie, which is Dante's Peak. Is that right? Yeah, this actually, you said you didn't know what a pyroclastic flow is, but this is one coming at you. Okay, so how fast is this moving? Like, is that truck going to get out of the way? Um, it varies. They can move very, very fast. I think, depending on how far away, I hope this truck survived. I've seen this picture a lot, and I don't have any other information on it. Uh-huh, okay, well. But I, there's really no way to know. They can sure. move up to, like, I don't know, hundreds. Okay, Got of it. miles or kilometers per hour. Wow. Okay. So fast. Very fast. Um, <clears throat> so Pinatubo was a huge eruption. Um, not as big as Tambora. I think about a, an eighth of the amount of material or a tenth of the amount of material was actually erupted from Pinatubo, but it was enough to get into the stratosphere, cause climate effects, and actually from the space shuttle, this photo was taken, and you can actually see the the lowest layer of the atmosphere here, the troposphere, which is where the where these clouds are. Uh, these are silhouettes of clouds, and it's reddish colored because it's the troposphere, so it's refracting a lot of sunlight. And then you can see this layer right here is actually the aerosols and particulates that were emitted from the eruption of Pinatubo into the stratosphere. Um, so that's crazy to me because they aren't quite as dark as like the clouds, right? So they're not as they're not going to reflect as much sunlight as the clouds, but they are visible um, in a cross section from space. Um, so they did get up into the stratosphere. And around the globe and they actually moved really quickly so I found these all of these figures are from a, um, a USGS study that was done after the eruption of Pinatubo the reason that we like I like to use Pinatubo as an example is because it happened in sort of the contemporary era of climate data monitoring uh, where we had satellites we had aircraft measurements we had balloons we had temperature sensors on the ground um, and, and they were more widespread across all of the globe and the continents. So we have a lot of data that we don't have during Tambora. We have some data from Tambora, but we have exponentially more data from the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. And so it's instructive because we can actually look at real nerdy things like the actual record of surface temperature, etc. Anyway, this figure here, well, first of all, here's where it is. It's on the main island of Luzon, um, a couple miles uh, a bit northwest of Manila, the largest city in the Philippines. Um, and when it erupted on June 15th, um, uh, 1991, it only took about a day for the plume of, uh, particles from the volcanic eruption to get almost all the way to the Malaysian Peninsula, which is, I didn't look up how many miles away it is from the Philippines, but it's far. Um, and within 20 days, so by like July 4th, those aerosols from the eruption of Pinatubo, which is right here, managed to circumnavigate the entire globe at the equator, at least. So aerosols from Pinatubo were observed in the stratosphere all the way from Pinatubo around through Central Africa, the uh, Central, uh, Northern South America, the Pacific Ocean, etc., right? All the way around um, the equator. And then within three months, the aerosols from Pinatubo were detectable in every part of the stratosphere from the North Pole to the South Pole. So this figure here shows four observations of the stratospheric atmospheric uh, aerosol concentration. It's presented as optical depth, which is just a measure of how much sunlight doesn't make it down to the surface, um, which means that there's something in the way and that something is an aerosol from Pinatubo. So you can see before the eruption, very little aerosols in the stratosphere. Um, uh, that's the blues, the dark blues is, is low and the reds are high and the greens are in between. Those are the scientific um, uh, values. Um, so, <laughs> so by you can see that by July, those aerosols had gone everywhere around the globe at the equator. And then by September, the whole stratosphere uh, was full of these aerosols from, um, from the eruption. And what's remarkable to me is that even three years later, in December of 1993, almost, what is that, two and a half years later, the amount of, of aerosols still in the atmosphere from the eruption was more than before the eruption. So it takes about three or a little over three years for all the aerosols to eventually fall out of the stratosphere after a large eruption uh, like Pinatubo. So 
this is uh, important information if we're thinking about geoengineering because it does take a while for aerosols to fall out, but not forever. Um, so three years is not forever. So I've seen, you know, um, proposals that we would basically have to put more, a pinatubo sized eruption amount of sulfur aerosols into the stratosphere every year or so uh, in order to combat, to counteract the amount of climate change that we've observed. So um, here's a really nerdy figure showing that, but just in a time series. So time after eruption, you can see that the amount of sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere starts out really high and only very slowly falls over time. So after 200 days, still relatively elevated. Um, and as I mentioned, it's up to three, three years really um, it takes for these aerosols to fall out. Here's a figure from all the way as, as far away as, as Laramie um, at 41 degrees north and a few other locations, a very high latitude, so far away from the equator. Um, so remember, the, the volcanic eruption is at the equator, but these measurements are from very far away at the equator looking at the mass mixing ratio. So basically how many aerosols are in the stratosphere per 1 million particles, or actually this is per 1 billion particles, PPB. So for every billion particles, this is how many of them are uh, sulfur dioxide uh, ash, essentially, or, or aerosols from the volcanic eruption. So you can see there's a big spike after Pinatubo, even as far north as 41 degrees, and then it stays elevated for a really long time. Um, this time series goes out to 600 days, almost two years. You can see that from before the eruption to after, we're still elevated. We're still almost 10 times more aerosols in the stratosphere, even 600 days after the eruption, as far north as 40 degrees. Um, so that's, that's kind of wild, actually. They stay up there for a long time. And because they stay up there for a long time, we can actually measure what effect they have on the climate. So this is a sensor that's on the top of I know, Ali got to show all these cool, like, figures of Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, and I'm showing, like, and here is the solar broadband transmission ratio. Um, so this is on the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, um, which is the tallest uh, peak in Hawaii, and actually, if you measure from the, from the base of the uh, ocean floor to the top of Mauna Loa, it's technically the tallest mountain in the world, right, Ali? Technically? Mm -hmm. And it's a volcano, but it's no longer active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Sorry, I was messing around. It's for the black graph. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. You told me to be funny. Yeah, so. you have been, you make me laugh more than like any other person, but anyway. Um, so this is a, a, an instrument that's on the top of Mauna Loa looking at the sun, measuring how much of the sun's um, energy is actually making it to the surface of that instrument. So Normally, if it was pure sun and there was nothing in the way, you would expect the transmission ratio to be 1. It's not because there's an atmosphere, so normally it's about 0.93. You can see there are two main volcanic eruptions that get in the way here. There's El Chichon in 1982 and then Pinatubo, and both of them block enough sun to lower the transmission ratio to like 0.8 or even lower, 0 0.75 to 0.8, right? Um, so El Chichon was like 0.7 something, and then uh, Pinatubo was about 0.8. So drastically reducing the amount of sunlight. So it actually does, in fact, a volcanic eruption and putting sulfur in the, in the stratosphere does, we can observe it using instruments that it does actually eliminate the sunlight from reaching the, reaching the surface. So this has two effects on temperature. Up in the stratosphere, this actually increases the temperature, warms the stratosphere, because you now have all these aerosols in the stratosphere, right? So the sunlight that wasn't getting to the surface some of it's bouncing around and staying in the stratosphere and warming up parts of the stratosphere. So you see a noticeable spike in 1991 of the stratospheric temperature due to the aerosols from Pinatubo. But at the surface, the temperature goes down significantly. And so here's a map from uh, the summer of 1992, June, July, August, average temperature anomaly. So how different it was from the normal, um, the normal amount of uh, temperature that, 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 the normal temperature that it would be. And you can see that even though Pinatubo is itself uh, here at the, at the equator, um, 
the temperature effects are actually felt across the planet. So you can see that. Uh, I love this figure too because it's like so. It was in the nine made in the nineties before we had like fancy computers, I guess, uh, to make these figures. So you can see like this black blob here is a negative two. That means a two degree Celsius cooler than normal summer in much of the uh, much of North America. So maybe it wasn't quite the year without a summer uh, like 1816, but the summer of 1992, I don't know if there are any Chicago folks watching or any people who lived in the upper Midwest uh, in 1992. If you remember it being particularly cold, I would be curious, curious to know that. Um, but you can see that even across the, the globe, much of, much, much of the globe was between zero and two degrees Celsius uh, below normal. And if you compare this to 1991 summer, which even though the eruption happened in 1991, the effects take a while, right, to, to precipitate because it takes a while to get those aerosols around the globe, you can see that the average global temperature anomaly went down by about a half of a degree Celsius, or about 0.4, I think, is like the annual average decrease. I think that's the next figure. Yeah, the, the average temperature of the planet, because of Pinatubo, decreased by about half of a degree, about 0.4 to 0.5 degrees uh, Celsius as a result of the aerosols from Pinatubo. So I think Tambora was more like a degree. Oh, someone just commented that the summer of 19, 1992 was awful, so that confirms <laughs> that. Um, but, uh, but um, yeah, so anyway, um, you can see here from this figure, which shows the global temperature anomaly from 1989 through 1993, um, Going up here, climate change, climate change, climate change, Pinatubo erupts and temporarily hides climate change. Okay, it temporarily cools the climate um, below normal, actually, providing a lot of evidence that if we were to geoengineer it, at least would, would quote unquote work if we're trying to lower the temperature of the planet. Um, obviously, all of these other effects that Ali was describing could also happen. Um, not from a volcanic eruption, but also from geoengineering. So that's something that we would really strongly need to consider. Like, is it ethical um, even to do this type of geoengineering if the effects are going to be famine and changes to precipitation patterns and, like, God forbid, the invention of the bicycle or something? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine? Um, so I think the last slide I have here is coming back to this idea of geoengineering um, and, and thinking, about, uh, thinking about if this is something that's feasible, if we can in fact alter the amount of sunlight that's being reflected through the placement of aerosols and particulates in the stratosphere um, to counteract the warming that's occurring because of global warming. And so how would we do that becomes the next big question in this conversation. How do we simulate a volcanic eruption? Some of the ideas are you could put them on a plane, you could put them in balloons, you could um, shoot them off of the back of a ship through a cannon, or as some of my students have asked me and suggested, you could just um, make a volcano erupt. Ali, can you make a volcano erupt? No. Uh, why? There are a lot of reasons why. Um, there's a lot of reasons why. I guess one being like we can't really get inside them in order to do anything. Um, the other is that part of my research was studying like what do volcanoes look like before they erupt. And for a lot of the time, they're literally chilling. Like, they're at low temperatures. Mm -hmm. They're not in a mostly liquid state. Um, they're in pretty low temperature conditions. So you'd have to find a volcano that was, like, about to erupt anyway. And then even then, I don't really know what mechanism you would use in order to make it erupt. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't think it's particularly feasible. Okay. Someone asked a question if, if there was a formula that would indicate the reflective effect for... Um, aerosol particles or is geoengineering limited to compare events to each other? Um, you can use models, climate models, to uh, kind of get a best guess of what would happen with a certain amount of aerosol in the stratosphere. Volcanic events are, are good for studying this because they're real-life experiments, basically. I think it would be very unethical if we were to, like, 
just simulate a volcanic eruption and see what happens. But because volcanic eruptions kind of happen, quote unquote, naturally, um, they provide a good way for us to see what the varying effects of are uh, with aerosols in the stratosphere. You can then take that and use that to inform a climate model to get like a best guess estimate um, of how much cooling you would get from what amount of aerosols. And I actually have my students do a, do a project in class where they have to um, gasp, work with math and numbers, uh, which is their favorite thing in the world. And uh, they um, find that you need about one to two pinatubos every year um, to cool the Earth's temperature down enough to balance out a doubling of carbon dioxide. So if we were to double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from, let's say, you know, the year 1900 to now, to, to whenever we're thinking, to counterbalance the warming from that, we would need one to two pinatubo type events every year. Um, so all of the negative effects of volcanic eruption like crop failure, um, changes to precipitation, year without a summer, etc., etc. Those are all possibilities that could happen if we were to to do this. Um, Additionally, there are some volcanoes, some volcanoes, all volcanoes erupt carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not just erupting, like, it's not like you're shooting, you know, you have a plane that's shooting sulfur dioxide straight into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, with volcanoes, you, you do have a bunch of other gases that you can't really control. Got it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> also, I'll say we're like, we're, we are winding down. I think this is like the last slide I have. So if you have questions about climate, geoengineering, and or volcanoes, probably more people are interested in volcanoes, honestly. Uh, you should ask them now um, so that we can answer them. Ali can answer them. But I do have two questions in the meantime, if people are thinking of some. Um, and I have a question for you. Oh, shit. Okay, let me ask, <laughs> mine, let me ask mine first. So okay. can we predict a volcanic eruption? No. Next question. No, I'm uh, <laughs> okay, goodbye. Um, that is that is so. It's such a complex question. Um, we are just, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think about the best way to even say it. Um, there are so many things that happen inside volcanoes that we don't even really understand. Mm -hmm. We don't understand the processes. We don't fully understand the timescales that they're happening on. Mm -hmm. and we also don't understand why and how. Some volcanoes um, are very different from other volcanoes in terms of when and how they erupt. And also some volcanoes um, vary a lot within themselves. Like sometimes when Yellowstone erupts, it's a huge caldera forming super eruption. Sometimes when Yellowstone erupts, it is a relatively minor eruption. Um, why does it do it one way and not the other? How can you tell if it's going to erupt one way and not the other? We currently don't know. There's so many variables. Um, it's really, really, really hard to predict when something is going to erupt. Unless it's, like, really close to the eruption and you can see some, like, warning signs. How close to the eruption? Like, a month? A day? An hour? Yeah, the only surefire way you know if a volcano is going to erupt is if you see uh, something called harmonic tremors mm -hmm. on a seismometer. Um, which basically represents the movement of magma up through the Earth's crust, like on its way to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens probably within like hours to a day, okay. I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But you can notice like increased earthquake activity, gas emissions, stuff like that, um, which again could just be natural and not mean an eruption's happening, or it could mean an eruption is about to happen. Quentin, but, yeah, Quentin just a couple weeks. Quentin, who is sitting in front of me, just texted me a follow up question to that <laughs> and asked, "What are the warning signs?" Uh, generally, like I said, like increased gas emissions or changes in gas emissions can reflect either um, the addition of new magma at depth or changes in the chemistry. Uh, earthquake activity can reflect the movement of magma um, under the surface. Um, what are all the other ones? Uh, gosh darn it. Uh, changes in like gosh. the ground surface. <laughs> changes in the ground surface. Like if magma is moving from one place to another, you could see like sinking or swelling. Uh, changes in temperature, stuff like that. Okay. 
Got it. All right, why don't you ask me yours, and then I have another question for you, too. Uh, Geoengineering, what do you think about it? What are your biases? You said you have a lot of biases. I just have a lot of biases. First of all, I... Um, and I, I know, I think people watching this probably have have, have thought about uh, geoengineering, maybe. Um, or maybe this is the first time they're being exposed to it. So I'm, I'm really curious, like, what folks think also. But I just think there are so many uh, ethical questions that are related that the science may work. Like, the thing, so we don't know a lot about geoengineering at all. The thing we know the most about is the science. I think the thing we or I think the thing we feel the most confident about is the science. And even that we don't know that much because all we have are climate models and volcanoes, volcanic eruptions to serve. So I know that the guy who wrote this book, um, who I find to be a very particularly interesting uh, character of a person, um, David Keith. He's given a, t a lot of talks on this. He's given, uh, he's written this book. He he teaches courses on this. He's a real big advocate. I think he actually recently just got funded to conduct an experiment, a real life experiment of geoengineering. <clears throat> and I don't know what that entails or, or how that's going to work out, but that's probably what needs to be done first if this is going to happen. My fear is that Geoengineering, um, putting aerosols into the stratosphere, the, the limiting factor in this world that we've created is money. Uh, and so I worry that Elon Musk is just going to go and like dump a bunch of sulfur in the stratosphere and he can do it because he has money. And so who, who decides that? Who, who administers that? Who regulates it? Um, you know, we've all seen the, the very realistic uh, movie about this called Geostorm. Geostorm! Which was highly recommended to me by one Dr. Ali Rubin. Um, you love it. It's, I love it, actually. Um, actually, because it is like a sensational sort of ridiculous movie, but like lots of problems could happen if we were to, to do this. And my thought is like, we're already running this like grand experiment on the world which is climate change and global warming so now we're going to do another one just seems uh i think humans think that we can just geoengineer our way out of everything we can just engineer our way out of everything and sometimes we can't and so the hard truth might be that we just have to deal with climate change and so i don't want to mis misrepresent david keith david keith argues that geoengineering would just be a stopgap he says that we're not moving fast enough on climate change mitigation, like legislation or policy, that it's getting out of hand and that if we did geoengineering for like a decade, maybe we could like pull it back and give bias some time. That's his argument. Um, personally, my bias is that I'm not convinced of that argument because, um, because like why, what incentive would there be? There would be less incentive to deal with this than more, right? Yeah. Also, someone just... Like Sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, go, go. Yeah. It's, it feels like the ultimate Elon Musk move, or Elon Musk style move to, instead of stopping carbon emissions and curtailing climate change, to just like take a nice plane up into the sky. That's right. That's right. Shoot yeah. a bunch of gas into it. With like Tesla branded on yeah. the side. And yeah. like the, the aerosols are shaped and in, in, they spell out Tesla. You see the sunset. It's like, okay. I'm disgusted. <laughs> um, someone also asked what happens. When the sulfuric acid falls back down to the earth, could there be any negative effects? Um, like, theoretically, sulfuric acid is not good for you, but the rate at which it would fall out of the stratosphere, my understanding is that it would it probably not have, like, immediate effects on human health, if that's what uh, Kelly is asking, but um, could have, like, you know, effects on, like, um, people who, with asthma. Uh, but also on crops, right? Didn't you say that like the ash and the sulfuric acid falling out of the sky like can ruin crops in the immediate vicinity? Would that apply think, over the whole yeah. globe? In the immediate vicinity, and Lockheed is another good example of that where there's so much uh hydrofluoric acid 
that people, it was like irritating people's throats and eyes because it was just like so dense in that area. Yeah. But I think once it's been in the stratosphere and it's like diluted itself by going around the world and spreading out throughout the stratosphere and then also very slowly settling out, I think it would be pretty um, unnoticeable by yeah. then. Yeah, that's my thought too. That's mm-hmm. my thought. Okay, I have one more question for you yeah. um, that everybody wants to know, and it's kind of unrelated to geoengineering, but it's about volcanoes. There's a lot been a lot of news reports that that Yellowstone is like on the verge of erupting. Can you just clear the air on like why Yellowstone erupting will be bad and why it's not going to erupt? Okay, if Yellowstone were to erupt, it would be bad. Um, most likely, uh, it has, like I said before. Uh, it has had th- at least three really large uh, super volcanic eruptions that have produced, you know, hundreds uh, to thousands of cubic kilometers of material uh, and had like devastating effects on everything. Mm-hmm. It's also produced some eruptions that were much smaller and mostly produced lava flows um, and did not have worldwide catastrophic effects. Um There is no evidence that Yellowstone is about to erupt. It's currently, I think, probably the best monitored volcano in the world. Um, It's in a super easy to access area. Um, Many, many people study it. There are samples readily available from it, and it's constantly being monitored. There's no signs that it is going to erupt. If there were, we would know about it and people would say something. And like I said before, we know so little about volcanoes. Um, Currently, people, when I was in grad school, my research focused a lot on like, how long does it take a magma chamber or a body of magma to go from being not eruptible to eruptible? And I said, my data showed that it was on the order of like, decades and people flipped out because they were like that's way too short it Mm. takes way more than decades to get a body of magma ready to erupt um so basically what i'm trying to say is that you are wrong (laughs) that's uh, that i'm a prophet um (laughs) that in order to produce a thousand cubic kilometers or more of eruptable uh magma Uh, You need a lot of time, you need a lot of heat, Mm -hmm. uh, you need a lot of energy, and that's not going to go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, fluctuations in gases and changes in temperature are scary, um, but they are not indicative of anything. Um, They're really not that far out of the norm. Okay, yeah. So we don't have to worry about about Yellowstone erupting. I wouldn't. I I study volcanoes, and I'm I'm not worried about it. Yeah, okay, fair. All right, yeah. so uh, there's no more questions, and I have no more questions. Do you have any more d- things you want to make fun of me about? or are we- No, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I hope I didn't mess anything up too bad. No, you are amazing, brilliant, and very funny, and uh, I think I speak for everyone, but also I find you to be a very engaging person, but I'm sure everyone is really glad that you came to talk about volcanoes. Can you just stay on the Zoom so I can say bye to you, like, for real? But I'm going to, like, stop the... What if I said no? The 